Hey guys, welcome to Irish Medieval History. And this week, I want to cover the amazing subject, which is Irish hurling. Irish hurling is possibly one of the greatest sports on the planet, and it's also one of the quickest and fastest. Furthermore, it's also one of the oldest sports on the planet. It's believed to be recorded as far back as 1272 to 1073. Although we're not quite sure if it pushes back that far, we do know for sure that by the 5th century, hurling was commonly played not just in Ireland, but overseas in Wales, the Isle of Man, and Scotland. Furthermore, by the time we go into the Viking Age, hurling has gone all the way over to Iceland. We know from the earliest sources that hurling was commonly played between two tuits, kingdoms were two groups, possibly around 50 to 75 men aside. They played hurling only. There was no other sport. And to score, the ball had to hit into a hole in either the ground or at the other end. The ball was either silver or bronze in the early periods. I don't know so much about the silver and gold part, but I do know that from the National Museum in Ireland, we do have balls made out of hair. What kind of hair, I'm not quite sure, but even darker still, if we go into the literature, we do know from the Ulster cycles that the warriors would fight each other in duels, mostly frowned upon in Ireland. However, in these duels, somebody would lose a head and with that, they would break open the skull, take the brains out. They would then roll the balls up and stew it. Quite literally, balls of brains. <laughs> and then, perhaps in future hurling, I could imagine, against a rival club, they would take these balls of brains out and use them as a form of further insult against the rival side. The hurlies were most likely similar to hockey sticks today. We are told that Satanta liked to strike the ball out of his hand into the air and he would run and catch it. Hurling in ancient times does seem to have been a way for warriors to train and to learn to fight. It was also a good way to get stronger and much more fitter. We can assume that actual combat with hurlies would not have been unheard of, although we do not know that there is any forbidden strikes or hurling strikes or blows. We know from the original sources that broken bones and bruises were quite common. We also know that the lower classes didn't play hurling. Hurling was only for the warrior class and the nobles. As I said before, it was only used to strengthen and make young men much more fitter. It was a game played by young men and in the early medieval period it was considered a rough tough sport with the attitude of boys will be boys. It was commonly played also in fairs and gatherings, much more similar to what they do in the continent going into the later medieval period with lancing. In fact, hurling continues to become much more popular where dueling and faction fighting in fairs was frowned upon. Hurling was very much encouraged. However, it doesn't mean everybody agreed with hurling. We do know that the English heavily frowned upon this Gaelic culture. And in fact, the Anglo-Irish, the Normans, who originally went to Ireland and took up hurling and quite enjoyed hurling, were condemned in doing so with the Statutes of Kilkenny, which barred them from playing hurling and referred to them that they should be and trained in the longbow instead of training with hurleys. Furthermore, as we go into the 12th century, this is where we see rewriting in literature. The Boyhood Deeds of Cucullum is written about the 12th century. Although we massively believe it was written much more earlier in the medieval period, it is here that the rewriting of history sees and really promotes hurling as boys will be boys type of game. Satanta, also known as Cucullum, goes out of his way to rough and tough it with other boys and is rewarded for doing so. Many modern historians see this as male toxicity, although I must highlight you should never look at medieval history from a modern perspective. 
In fact, this type of attitude was acceptable because in this period, men and women were fighting to survive and it was encouraged for people to be much more tougher because of this. In this day and age, depending on your region, where you live and what your life is like, perhaps maybe it's not best. Regardless, this was the way and times of these periods, of which is the medieval period, believe it or not. However, I completely disagree that you shouldn't judge people from a modern perspective. Also, given that you also had dueling and faction fighting at the same time during the medieval period, hurling wasn't that much of a male toxicity sport, if you want to look at it from a modern perspective. But as I said before, you shouldn't be looking at these things from a modern perspective. In fact, both komogi and hurling, which is played in Ireland today, are still very tough and rough sports. And I think it's massively a part of Irish culture. So to refer to hurling as male toxicity, especially when you have komogi today, is, well, in my opinion, just completely ignorant. Hurling is a massive part of our culture. And in fact, we're very lucky it has survived throughout the times. When the British occupation would come in much more later on, it only survived because of the earlier Anglo-Irish that had come into Ireland had preserved the sport, hiring locals in their area and keeping teams. Cannot liquor. Earlier on, I was saying that Iceland had been massively influenced by Ireland when it comes down to hurling. And we can see that with cannot liquor. In this sport and what we can get our from information, it is massively similar to hurling. In fact, when you put the rules together, even in, from a modern perspective of modern hurling, it is very similar to each other. Sports, both sports are very rough. They consist of passing a ball and are played by nobles. We know the Hiberno-Scandinavians were massively into hurling and most likely had brought it over to Iceland with them. We know this because there are grave slabs in Ireland with hurlings. So most likely there is a massive connection between Iceland and hurling from Ireland that we can see here. Obviously, that's not just the only location. We can see the same in both Wales, the Isle of Man and Scotland in what we would call Celtic culture. And most likely at the time, with no surprise, this is mostly a period of that high mix between the two cultures, between the Celtic and the Norse cultures of the time. And most likely the Hiberno Scandinavians were influencing all of these cultures around them, being highly influential between the Irish Sea all the way up to the North Atlantic. Anyway, I think that's enough food for thought for uh, this week. Definitely tell me what you guys think. Um, that whole toxicity thing, I think, is just really silly, to be quite honest with you. Um, looking from a modern perspective into the medieval period, of course, we're not talking about modern period, although I was using a lot of images from modern hurling, um, especially the rough and tough stuff, just so you guys have an idea of what it was like back in the medieval period. Obviously, guys don't really go all that tough in the modern period they're too busy playing the actual game but i needed to take those clips out regardless just so you know what was normal in the medieval period just to toughen men and women of that era anyway guys as always definitely um, subscribe to your channel give us an old like and an old follow and tell me what you guys thought of this video you know uh, what was your feedback from it what was your food of thought uh, because most of the time when you guys put down comments god they're actually quite amazing and definitely stuff that i've missed before uh, from the annals all the way to um, archaeology you guys sometimes put out some amazing um, information that really blows my mind so definitely keep that up Anyway, other than that, guys, all the best. Oh, and check out the merchandise.